Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event. We're excited to welcome you to our panel this evening, highlighting the leadership and vision of young climate activists. My name is Benjamin Kiesling, and I am a research scientist at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University. And my name is Kailani Acosta. I'm a third year PhD student in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. Benjamin and I have been working with Lauren Ritchie, who will be moderating this event over the past semester to create Columbia Climate Conversations. We would like to thank the Office of Academic Diversity and Inclusion in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences for sponsoring tonight's event. This is the second event in the Columbia Climate Conversation series, highlighting critical topics at the intersection of earth and climate science, sustainability, and environmentalism. I want to start tonight by amplifying the work and the words of the Native American Council at Columbia University. The Lenape lived here before and during the colonization of the Americas. We recognize these indigenous people of Manhattan, their displacement, dispossession, and continued presence. This acknowledgement stands as a reminder to reflect on our past as we contemplate our way forward. This event was Lauren Ritchie's vision. Lauren is a 19 year old climate activist, writer, podcast host, and third year student in sustainable development and political science at Columbia. Lauren is originally from the Bahamas and is the creator of the EcoGal, which is a digital platform that educates on climate justice, promotes intersectional climate action, and seeks to make sustainable living more accessible and inclusive by amplifying the voices of marginalized communities. We're so excited to host this conversation on youth activism in action this evening and continue the conversation about leadership, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility in climate and environmental action. Now I'll turn it over to Lauren, who will be moderating tonight's conversation. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for tuning into tonight's event. Um, as Benjamin and Kehlani said, tonight we're going to be highlighting the amazing work of the four young panelists that we have here today and really getting into intersectionality and climate activism, as well as how young people can get involved. So without further ado, I will let um, the four panelists introduce themselves and let you all get to know a little bit more about their work. So um, Genesis, why don't you start us off? Let everyone know how old you are, where people might have seen you before, um, the type of work you do, and anything else you want to highlight. Hi, everyone. My name is Genesis, and I'm 14 years old, and the work that I do is climate um, activism right now. I'm also an animal rights activist, and I talk about how animal agriculture is harming our planet. And um, I could have been seen on the Marvel Hero Project, where I was Marvel superhero. And then also, um, I do a lot of just different like news things, so I could have been seen on the news also. Thank you, Genesis. Um, Hannah, how about you go next? Hi, thank you, Lauren. My name is Hannah Testa. I'm 18 years old and I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I am an environmental activist with a primary focus of plastic pollution, ocean conservation, and climate change. I founded the nonprofit organization Hannah for Change when I was 10 years old. And Hannah for Change has a mission to help protect people, animals, and the planet through education, collaboration, and advocating. So my main focus is educating young people on these important environmental issues, but also inspiring them to speak up and take action on them. Um, I do a lot of work in the policy space as well. So um, testifying, lobbying. Um, last year, I helped unveil the National Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act at the Capitol. Um, so you could have seen me <laughs> from that. Um, I also published a book uh, last year called Taking on the Plastics Crisis. Thank you, Hannah. Um, Easter, you can go next. Hi, my name is Isra and I'm 17 um, from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, and when I was 15 years old, I co-founded US Youth Climate Strike, um, which was a youth climate um, strike organization. And we organized numerous strikes across the country, um, most notably March 15th and September 20th of 2019. Um, as of right now, I'm really just an organizer. I don't really focus on a specific issue um, and have just been focusing on doing local work here in Minneapolis. Thank you. And Helena, you're up next. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elena. Uh, I'm 18 years old and I come from an indigenous community in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Um, my work evolves a lot around indigenous people's rights, advocating for the protection of the Amazon um, and climate change, 
I think all of that has, um, it's all connected. And, and I think that is super, super important um, for to like understand um, how indigenous people are living and how indigenous people are uh, contributing to the fight against climate change and, and to the protection of the Amazon. So, yeah. And you may recognize me, I don't know, from maybe social media, um, maybe in the news, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, thank you for, for those amazing introductions. Um, can't even begin to express how proud we are of all of you for the amazing work that you're doing. Um, and I think as kind of a grounding question to get us started right now today for this panel, we're gonna be talking a lot about climate activism specifically. So I was wondering for each of you, um, what did your introduction to sustainability and environmentalism look like? Like, how did you get started? What did that introduction look like? Anyone can go with those I guess I can start um so I grew up in Minnesota um and I was always like a pretty climate aware kid you know talking about recycling and stuff um but I really got super introduced when I heard about line three um which is a pipeline going through indigenous um land in northern Minnesota and Canada um and I heard about it when I was like 12 in middle school and so I ended up researching and looking into it. And when I got into high school, I was able to join my school's green club. Um, and that was the first introduction I had to climate organizing in that world. Um, so yeah. I can go next. Um, I first got involved, I was in probably fourth grade, I was learning about endangered animal species and it broke my heart as a child to learn how the animals that I loved and have roamed around for millions of years could go extinct during my lifetime. And I knew I couldn't sit back and not do anything about it. And I had to get involved. So I used the resources I had. I went online and I found organizations in my area. They're helping to protect animals. And I pitched in to help. And through my work, I started learning about environmental issues, mainly because of its impact on animals. But through that, I realized how big of an impact environmental issues have on all of us. And ever since then, I've been just speaking up and speaking out. Um, so I grew up in, in a community, an indige indigenous community in the Amazon that was constantly threatened by oil companies. So for as long as I can remember, um, my community and like my people um, have always been fighting. Uh, and I guess like it, it, it was always like happening in my life. So um, you know, like a lot of um, family members of mine were leaders in our communities and had to um, like be in this work and like doing it every day. Um, and, you know, knowing at such a young age that your home is threatened, um, it, it makes you react in some kind of way. Um, and as I grew older, I realized I have a voice. I have, you know, um, I have something that maybe people in my community didn't have, I was able to speak like Spanish, I was able to speak um, English, uh, which is a great tool to like, let people know what is going on, what is happening. Um, so like literally just like doing my part um, in, in my community, um, as everything we do is in community. So someone is doing something else, someone is doing some, some other part of the work and I am doing this. Um, so yeah, it's, it's for me, it's, it's always just been there from, from because of where I am from. Um, the way that I found out about what was happening to like the environment was um, after I went vegan, then I started to want to um, become an activist. And then I found out about all the different causes and the environment was the one that I ended up going with because we need a thriving planet to live on. So um, I wouldn't be able to live on a not thriving planet. So I decided to speak about it because at the time, like it wasn't super talked about. So I didn't really know like our planet was being um, destroyed. So then I decided to speak up, use my voice about it. So that's basically how I got into it was I found out and I knew I had to do something about it. Thank you all for sharing. I think it's so interesting how, whether it was through your own personal experiences or something you learned in school, definitely from an early age, it's very possible to hear about these issues and feel something about it and want to make a difference. And I think especially 
since in the like past few months, we've seen definitely a rise in social justice, in climate justice. Um, we've also seen the rise in the word activist being used more commonly than it possibly has been used in the past. And I think what I would like to know is what being an activist or being a climate activist or a social justice activist means to you. And I think kind of understanding when you knew you wanted to be an activist, whatever that means, and also whether or not your understanding of the role of what it means to be an activist has changed over time. I guess I can start again. Um, I think that the word activist, I don't know, it's definitely a commodified word. I feel like people have definitely changed the meaning um, where posting on Instagram can be the same as organizing a rally. Um, and so I don't know if um, the word activist is the right word for me, um, but I do think though that the meaning of it, um, it, like just the idea of resistance is not something that was ever a want for me, but just existing as a black Muslim woman um, in Minnesota just really allowed for me to realize that my existence and everything around me was always going to be um, on fire. And so I had to figure out a way to deal with that fire and figure out ways in which to create change so that that fire doesn't exist anymore. Um, and so I think that growing up in such a space where your identity is so polarizing, uh, like allows you to just move into these spaces. Um, so I don't know if, yeah, I don't know if it's activist, but I definitely like think about um, organizing and community building um, as important words to me. I can go next. Um, as it was such a like big part of like my my life, I I like the word activist is very new to me. I don't really like I don't really relate to that word. Um, I don't look at my the people in my community I'm like oh they're the activists um so for me like that word is strange but I know that a lot of people use it because it's an easy label so I'm I'm pretty okay with that um but for me like to be able to be in these spaces it, it implies a lot of responsibility because I come from a community that is extremely marginalized in Ecuador um from well, not just my community, but indigenous communities um, in general, in um, South America and in, in Latin America and in, in the Amazon. Um, so for me, that is a responsibility to make sure that I actually do my part um, and, and be a member of those communities, even though I may be far, far away from that. Um, and also just to like, I feel like, what we today call activism is what we have been doing for so long um, and that that has never really been recognized. And for example, like when I think about the children that are back in my community, those are the ones that in 10, 20 years are gonna be the leaders of our communities. Those are the people that are going to be the ones that defend our lands, that protect the Amazon. Um, so, those people are not the ones we would look at as activists, but they are actually like super, super important people in, in, the, in, in these talks, in, in what is climate activism or environmental activism or the protection of forests, of lands. Um, so it's, it's really like hard to, you know, like what is activism and who, who gets to be called activist uh, because of like the, the, the difference in, in people's words. I would probably, geez, yeah, how do you define activism? I think what I agree with Isra said that, you know, activism is different for everybody. It could be, you know, organizing, could be, you know, communicating on social media. There's so many different avenues and or being an activist has so many different pathways. There's not one perfect solution. Um, there's not one way to be an activist. And as Helena said, some people don't choose this activism life. Sometimes it's something that you have to do as a means of survival. But I think overall for environmental issues, we're doing this to protect our future, our generation and generations to come. And for me, having a younger brother, I want him to live in a world that doesn't need protecting anymore. And I've noticed a lot for young environmental activists with these issues being ticking time bombs, by the time we're old enough to be in these positions of power, it'll be far too late. 
And so now more than ever, we are speaking up because we are running out of time. So I think that's something that I've seen pretty common in all the other youth activists that I meet that there is a lot of hope that you know we can have effective change, but it's also fear, fear for our own future and fear for you know our friends and our family. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that um, everyone wants to have a thriving planet to live on, especially like you don't want to have to grow up having to protect your planet. But I mean, the situation where we're that we're in right now, we have to do this. We have to use our voices, even if we don't want to, because um, it's a bunch of youth now that are speaking up about th these issues. And that's really important because youth have very powerful voices. And I think um, activism has really changed for me is like at first I thought like being an activist was just like going to protest and um just like getting out and getting active but then once um quarantine happened we had to start finding different ways so like um everyone's on social media so you can just like post and a bunch of people will see it or there's like so many different ways of activism but they're all super effective so I think activism has really changed for me and I think that um, it's really awesome seeing how there's a bunch of youth now talking about it because we're going to be the ones to make the change. I think that's so great what all of you mentioned. I think definitely what we do see a lot of is, I guess, people boxing it in that activism has kind of a one size fits all approach or there's really only one way to be an activist. Um, and that type of idea can be very harmful. So I think what you guys are expressing about you know, the way that activism can be a personal experience, or especially what a lot of you have mentioned about how it can be informed by your identity or by your community is so, so important in understanding what environmental work in what fighting for your communities or marginalized groups really means. And I think kind of on that topic, in the vein of trying to, you know, emphasize and highlight diversity and inclusion, um, last fall for the Columbia Climate Conversations, we hosted a panel on intersectional environmentalism, and we were really talking all about the lack of diversity in the climate space um, and just how much progress needs to be made in these movements. And I was wondering for you for what has your experience been like in terms of diversity and inclusion in the spaces that you're doing your work in? And why do you think that this lack of diversity and representation can be so harmful? And then on the flip side, what steps do you want to see made to see some improvement? Okay, I can go first <laughs> this time. Um, I could definitely say, and I'm sure that many of these girls here have similar stories of being, you know, the only person of color in a lot of these environmental spaces, either like at conferences or events. Um, we see a lot of tokenism of, you know, thinking that we can reflect our whole community or reflect all people of color when that's not the case. And we cannot advocate and speak on behalf of all people of color as one person. And I think sometimes they don't understand that. And actually, Genesis and I were at an event and we even experienced segregation. <laughs> and it's it's still very prevalent. And I think it's not very talked about how environmental conservation is really led by white males. It's a very white dominated field for a space where environmental issues mainly impact people of color, black, indigenous, brown, low income communities are gonna be impacted by the impacts of climate change first and the worst. And another example is climate activist from Uganda, Vanessa Nakat, when she was cropped out of that photo of other climate activists. Like it's very, it's very prevalent in the environmental space. And I think there's still a lot of work to be done, but I think especially with the lockdown, a lot more movements are starting to reflect on themselves and see where they've been lacking and realizing that maybe they are more of a white savior organization and understanding how they can better include people of color, not just for a photo op, but actually having them be a part of the narrative and helping to be a part of the team. So I've definitely seen a lot of reformation, a lot of people reorganizing and reworking their whole structures that they have, which I think is incredible, but there's still always a long way to go. Um, it's a process of learning and unlearning, um, but I think, especially now more than ever, we're being able to have a seat at the table and include more people of color along with us. And I think it can be frustrating, especially um, to try and explain to people that we're still not 
there's still not people like us at the table when they're like, oh, well, there's, you know, the five of us here, like, isn't that enough? No, because there's so many other young people, especially young people of color activists that are speaking up and are still fighting to have their voices heard, but aren't given the seat at the table. And I think it's also so important for us to highlight other young people and bring them to the table with us because there are not enough opportunities for us. So there's still a long way to go, as I said, but I think we're still moving in the right direction. Um, for me, I think it's been really different uh, because, because I grew up in a community. Um, so for until like two years ago, everything I knew was indigenous people fighting, indigenous people leading like these huge protests in Ecuador, um, demanding our territories to be recognized as our territories, not something of the state and, and actually accomplishing that um, and seeing like all these big political changes being pushed by indigenous people. Um, but then it's for me, it also was like, uh, when I was younger, um, I couldn't understand why non-indigenous people wouldn't join us or wouldn't like support us or like be allied to us. Um, and, and I like, now I'm like starting to understand like why that happens, like because of, um, because like there's a lot of racism in Ecuador, there is a lot of uh, segregation, there is a lot of, you know, um, you you stay in the forest and we are in the city, kind of like that's the mindset people have sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, to see that was like kind of shocking when I, when I started to realize like, okay, these people, they don't actually want us to be here sometimes. Um, but then I've also had like very good experiences with people like, actually wanting to learn more and just like um, to see people that maybe live 20 minutes from a community they have no idea there is a community because like they are not taught that there are communities in our areas um, but then they're super interested in actually helping like when they get information so like spreading information is so so important for us like communication um, like letting people know that the, these fights are actually going on and they might be 30 minutes away from you um, and, and yeah, like, I think that um, in my case, I've seen a lot of, you know, I've seen indigenous people lead these fights, but I've never seen them get the recognition that they actually deserve, um, not uh, on national level, not national levels, uh, not on international levels. Um, and I think like during the past year, maybe I've seen like some improvements in that. And that's been really like cool to see, to see that the people that, um, actually that I know that I've known since I was very small are like being recognized on um, on like big you know in big spaces and that's been really that's been really amazing to see because like some people don't even think that that is possible um, that someone from a community could actually be something or like become something or like accomplish these things um, so yeah, like that goes back again to like responsibility on me, like how how I have to like handle these things and like include people where in the spaces where I am. And especially when I am in Ecuador, if I um, have a space, I'm definitely make sure I have three other indigenous girls with me um, so that they also get the space. Just last week we had this interview on TV and like, um, you know, like it's it's so much better to like share those spaces and 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 tell like different stories because like I have one and then there are a million other stories that are um, so so important. Um, so yeah, I think like it's we're still working on it everywhere. I think, but um, we need to we need to make some improvements as well. Yeah, I think that um, there is like some people that are um, people of color in the movement, but like Hannah said, like they're not really represented. And um, 
like they don't have these big platforms to speak on. So um, it's harder to really get out there if you don't really have a platform to speak on and to talk on. But um, there are ways that you could help this. And I know that there are like people of color that are activists right now, like fighting for this because um, I started a movement in quarantine called Youth Climate Save. And I have 70 chapters of a bunch of youth and um, more than half of them are people of color. So there is youth out there. They just need to have this platform to speak on on like um I'm really lucky to have this platform but I know that there are some youth that don't have that right now so um like just to get like a platform and to do talks and stuff like that I think um there are a bunch of them they're just not like really out there because they don't really have that platform to speak on yeah I think that um having a platform is definitely something that has to do with it um I guess like for me I like started getting involved in like I guess environmental justice by joining my school's green club and I go to a predominantly black school but my green club was predominantly white if actually I think I was the only black person um and for me getting into this space as a 14 year old all I assumed was that this movement was about camping and recycling um rather than talking about things like environmental racism or um oil and pipelines um and so coming into this space I had obviously I've never really been camping. I didn't have access to those things growing up um, in a low income black household. And so it was just a really big culture shock for me. Um, and getting into it, I think one of the biggest problems I had was that people would focus so much more on um, trying to get rural communities into our climate space rather than focusing on getting the urban um, folks, even though we were organizing in or urban spaces. So we couldn't even get the people in our own communities to join, yet we were reaching out to people who lived four hours away. Um, and I think another thing is it's like, um, while I think that diversity is such a big thing, I think tokenization is also a really big thing like Hannah was talking about. Um, I think that my entire platform or my existence as a climate activist has really been massively on the fact that I am a black person. Um, literally majority of the articles or interviews I've ever done, you have black stapled onto it. Um, I'm seen as a black woman um, and every black history month, you know, I get tagged in numerous posts. And while I appreciate it and I'm glad to be this like thought, like this idea of diversity, it's a slap in the face because nobody ever looks at me um, besides the fact that I am somebody who grew up in Minneapolis and happens to have black skin. Um, because it's such a phenomenon. And I think that that says a lot um, as well. You've all raised such excellent points. And I think definitely to Isra's last point about tokenization, that is a huge, huge problem when it comes to just thinking about when you finally do get the diversity that all of you have highlighted is so, so important to advance this work. Because like you were saying, if you know, there isn't that emphasis on putting the voices and stories of black and brown folks into the climate movement, then it's not really doing the justice for the people who need it the most. So I think, yes, we want that diversity and the representation, but we also want to be, you know, applauded and highlighted for our merit and value and not just for the color of our skin or not just to be, you know, the token black person for the claim of having diversity. And I think that has been kind of a genesis point a major setback for a lot of activists of color, especially environmental activists in trying to get into these spaces or to build platforms. Because even if you are out there doing the work, it's a lot harder to get that recognition, especially when it comes to building online platforms. So being a young woman of color is already difficult enough as it is. And I think the next thing that I wanted to talk about after that is not only are you women of color, but you're also very, very young. And I think with this being a panel that's especially highlighting youth activism, I think it's very important to talk about how age plays a big deal in any type of activism work, but especially in these climate spaces that, as Hannah was saying, are mainly dominated by old white men. So thinking about this, how has your age played a role in being taken seriously as an activist? And I think kind of as a jumping off point, I'm going to put two questions in one on this one, but also reflecting on your age and your experiences, what has it felt like to be so young and to be doing such important work? Like thinking about, you know, being recognized or claimed to be like one of the voices of your generation. Is that like a sense of pride and responsibility to be maybe like the representation that you didn't have growing up? 
or is it a lot of pressure that you you know didn't know is what you were signing up for and yeah whoever wants to start Um, I can go first. Uh, I definitely had, had no idea what I was signing up for. Um, I, ha I didn't like even think about, you know, having a platform. Um, and then it just like kind of happened. Uh, but it, it definitely is a responsibility for me because I know that I think I am the one of the few, very, very few people that actually have a platform on social media from uh, the Amazon in Ecuador. Um, they're like, I may be in the top three even or top two, I, I don't know, but like very, very few Amazonian indigenous people have platforms um, on, on social media. And for me, I obviously like see the weight that it has it like, um, and, and what we can do with social media. Um, and I think that that goes back to like the age thing. Um, people seeing young people on social media, um, kind of, I don't know. Like I, I receive a lot, a lot of like people saying like, "Oh, she's a child, and she's just doing this for attention," or like she's doing this because she thinks it's fun, and like comments like that, which is like very strange to me because. Uh, I literally never chose this. Uh, this was, as I have said, like many times now, um, I was born kind of into it. Um, and so, yeah, like age-wise, I, I get that kind of response sometimes, which is negative. Um, but then to have a platform and like being kind of this um, image of, of what like indigenous activism is, um, I think it's quite damaging for other indigenous people actually, which I'm like very, very concerned of and like very aware of also um, because I think it, this goes back to tokenism as well. Like people want to put me as the face of indigenous activism and Amazonian indigenous people. And I could never represent that I like the that those spaces are so diverse um and 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 i think it it also like gets to the point where i'm where people want me to take up spaces that i could not do that for example like leaders uh where leaders should be like elected indigenous leaders should be and they want me to be there because i have a platform or because like um people in ecuador may know me um so like there are a lot of like things to think about when you are on social media like where is my place actually am i actually doing good here or will i actually be damaging people because if i take up a space i'm maybe i'm limiting someone else um that does not have a platform and is um has a much more important voice in in that matter um so yeah i think like it when we are on social media we definitely like need to be responsible Yeah, I definitely want to agree. I think that um, you definitely have to like make sure that you're not taking up too much space and like taking that step back when needed. I definitely try my best to just because I acknowledge that I have a lot of privilege in a lot of spaces. Um, and when it comes to like certain interviews or press, like definitely handing those over to people in the community that I know, um, definitely for sure. Um, when it comes to my age, I think that it's definitely intimidating to a lot of older folks. I think to be in spaces, I used to be on a lot of calls with older white people um, and just sitting there and disagreeing with them on anything really is just a really big intimidation thing. Um, also, I think that like, it's super interesting. I used to judge like middle school debate um, and the little kids would like look up to me and they would like tell me how cool I was because of the work that I was doing. And it was just like super crazy because I was like, you guys are like four years younger than me. Um, but I don't know, I was like 16 at the time and it meant a lot. And I think that um, still being that idea of representation does mean a lot to a lot of people. But at the same time, I think it's a little bit unfair. I think that Gen Zers are like kind of forced into um, action. Like when I was younger, I didn't really want to like be this kind of face or do the work, I guess, in a way. 
but I really felt like I had to because I felt like if I didn't, then who else would? Um, and that got me the mindset of like, I have to just keep going. And that led to burnout um, because I felt like I had this really big expectation um, being at my age and being in the spaces that I was. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think age can definitely be an obstacle, but also can be uh, very helpful, be a strength for some people. I think sometimes people use your age to diminish you, diminish your worth, your education, your passion, because, oh, you're too young to know what you're talking about. So sometimes it just takes you, you know, proving your point and proving to them that, no, you know, my age is just a number, but I know what I'm talking about and I have the research and I have um, the passion to be here and to have my seat at the table. So I think sometimes that is a barrier you have to overcome and hurdle over. And like you said, burnout is very real. I've experienced burnout. It can be very overwhelming in the space, especially as a young person trying to best manage, you know, school, our normal lives, friends and family, but also the work that we do, because in a sense, we dedicate our lives to this work because it, it's a lot of work and it, it can be really draining. So it also, it could take a lot from us, but it's also very fulfilling and you get to meet so many incredible like-minded people that also fill your love jug is something me and my mom say, um, like meeting people like you guys, you know, that motivates me to keep going um, because it reminds me that I'm not alone. Um, there's other people like me doing work. Um, but on the representation side, um, I remember growing up doing the work that I was doing. There weren't a lot of young activists growing up and there weren't a lot of people that looked like me that were doing good work. And um, as a Muslim woman, there weren't a lot of um, representation, let alone a South Asian. Um, a lot of times the stereotype in the media and on TV shows is being, you know, victims to bullying and being pushovers. And I wanted to prove that, no, I can, I can stand my ground and get in front of the stage and talk to people and know what I'm talking about. So that was definitely something that I also had to overcome. And now I'm really glad to be you know, a leader or mentor to other young people um, and to see that I'm not the only one. There's so many other incredible young people, just like these incredible ladies I'm on this panel with that other young people can look up to because I wish I had that growing up. I wish I had people like you guys to look up to and be like, wow, it's not just old white men that are doing this work, you know? So I think I'm so grateful to be with these incredible ladies um, because you truly inspire me even now, um, but I know that you definitely inspire so many other young people that look up to you. I totally agree. I think that um, burnout, I found out about that when I um, first started, because like there's so many issues that like you really want to talk about and that you want to focus about, but um, it can kind of like hurt because like there's so many things that like going wrong with like the planet. So it's like there can be something new every single day. And since you're so young, it's kind of hard to deal with at times. But um, I think, yeah, like burnout, um, that was one thing that I had to start to learn to deal with but um I think age can really help you like Hannah said and it can kind of like um be like people won't take you as serious um because when I started I was six so um some people would be like oh like this is just like a phase like she's gonna like grow out of it like she just loves animals right now but when she like gets older she won't love animals anymore um but then I keep on going and then they're like oh like well like surely loves animals and um like they can actually take you more serious sometimes because it's like I didn't know about all these issues and she's so young and she knew about all these things so um it can kind of help you but then once you get older I think it gets a bit harder because then you get more difficult questions and they take you um more serious than they did like because some people like um, mistake me sometimes for being like an adult and they'll ask me super hard questions. And it's like, like I'm only 14, like I can answer it. But I mean, um, sometimes like you can, like when you're older, like they mistake you for being a lot older than you are. But when you're younger, like they don't take you as serious, but like they still do take you serious because it's like, wow, like, she knows all this. But I think that um, just like balancing like yourself and like your activism can really help um, because you can't be a great person and help others if you're not helping yourself. So um, I think just finding like a balance of like um, being an activist and making sure that you're happy with yourself.
Thank you for, for those brilliant answers. All of you touched on so, so many amazing points. And since, I mean, I could talk to you guys all night, but since we are running out of time on our hour, I'm gonna ask you guys one more final question before I open up the floor and ask some of the Q and A questions that we've been getting in the chat. But just kind of as a final question, after all the brilliant insight that you've all shared, um, what advice would you give to students or young people who want to get involved in climate activism, whether that's like practical ways to get involved or touching on that burnout that you guys just mentioned, how do you find the time to prioritize your childhood, your joy, your mental health, self-care, just lay out all the advice that you'd give from your experience of how people can you know, get more involved. I can go first. Um, climate anxiety is very real, so make sure to take care of yourself and make sure to set time aside from your day for yourself. Um, because I know as, as activists, we want to put our all into everything we do. And it's hard to say no, um, because we always want to put all of our time and effort into things. But it's always so important to focus on yourself and focus on your support system, as well as maintaining those friendships and having those relationships with your family to fall back on when you need it. Um, and take time for yourself when you need it. Um, it's, it's very important and sometimes you have to learn that the hard way, you know, having to go through a burnout and experience that for yourself to learn how to best take care of yourself. Um, but it's always great to practice that before, you know, experience a burnout for yourself. But for those that want to, you know, get involved and actually don't really know where to start, I always talk about finding your why and finding your purpose to why you want to do this work, not just, you know, for, you know, social media picture of you at a protest, but actually finding a purpose of, you doing this work and actually putting your all into this work and having that why having that purpose is something that you can fall back on when you reach challenges and obstacles um, when you see mean comments online that'll help you and motivate you to overcome those challenges and to keep moving forward so i think that's something very crucial to have have that as a reminder for yourself to keep going um, but also you know educate yourself become a mini expert on these issues because like Jensa said, you know, with our age, you'll get a lot of questions, a lot of people that'll doubt, you know what you're talking about um, because of your age. So it's so important to really, you know, know, know what you're talking about because people will be hammering you with questions about it. So you have to prove to them that you know what you're talking about. Um, but also finding a network of people. There's so many other young people out there doing this work. Don't be afraid to reach out to, the, reach out to them and find these connections find these mentors um, and friends uh, to help uplift you and connect and collaborate because you can do so much more work together than on your own. Um, the weight of the world is not as heavy if we all lift it together. And that's something that I love sharing with people because it's gonna take all of us coming together on these issues. Um, there's not gonna be one person that's gonna save us from these issues. It's gonna be all of us um, intergenerationally coming together. So don't be afraid to speak up, even if you think, you know, you're, you're going to stand out from your school or um, your parents won't fully agree with it. There's so many other young people. We're all here to support you and uplift you. I know I'm always here. If you guys, anyone listening wants to reach out, I'm sure many of these other girls are the same, that we all want to help you and support you. So please feel free to reach out. Um, yeah, good luck with all of your work. I can go next. Um, I think, yeah, like I totally agree with what Hannah was saying. And um, when you first start, I think something that um, can really help you is finding like an activist friend. Um, Cause there are like activist youth out there and it's like, it's a lot easier if like there's someone that you can relate to cause they probably went through the same things or they're like experiencing it. Um, because when I first started, it was kind of hard for me cause I felt like I was the only youth talking about this issue. And um, like when you first really get into it, it's like, there's so many issues that you can really focus on. So like um, figuring out what issues you want to really talk about and what you want to focus on at the time, um, just so that you don't feel um, like 
everything just like pushed on you because it's a lot. Um, but I think really like finding people that um, are similar to you can really help you because if I knew that there was people like me, it would have made it a lot easier because sometimes you can feel like you're alone. And um, like Hannah said, like just like stand out and put yourself out there because um, right now, if I was an activist, I probably would be in my bed. I probably would be like wanting to sit in like the back of the room. But I think um, just putting yourself out there because if you do that then um it can show other youth like you're not alone and that there's people like you out there and it will empower them to want to do the same and it can also help um other people want to do the same and if they like haven't really found um what they're passionate about they can see your issue and be like oh wow like I feel really passionate about that and they'll want to talk about it too so just putting yourself out there Um, I think that for me, um, it's always been about like where I come from. Uh, so like for me to like be able to kind of just forget everything and relax, I just like literally just go back to where I come from, go back to what to the why I'm doing this. Um, and especially when like all I, I get very overwhelmed when a lot of things are happening. And I think this is super normal because yes, like right now we're talking in a climate panel, but I'm sure all of you, you're worried about like social justice issues, like a lot of other things that happens around you and that are equally important, but you may not be just like recognized for that. Um, and then all these things are happening at the same time and you you just like don't understand like why 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 doesn't things work why does not like the world work um and then i think it's just like really important to find that peace in yourself and just like okay i gotta keep going i have to stay healthy to be able to do this um for a longer time um if i'm exhausted if i'm not doing this then you know, it's, it's, it's not worth it, like working yourself to um, working so hard that you can't do it anymore. Uh, it's, it's not healthy. It's not healthy for you. It's not healthy for, for, for the community you're in. Um, so yeah, like just remember why you're doing it and make sure that you're okay while you're doing it. And if people want to get involved um, for, especially for me, um, the causes that I support in in Ecuador um, are, you know, it if it gets like attention in, on social media, um, in the news, it puts a lot of pressure on people that are doing bad things over there. Um, so for me, just like um, keep like, you know, watch, have like, you know, try to like be aware of what is going on, try to like follow the things that are going on and see in what way you can support a certain issue um because like sometimes we need to share things like petitions sometimes um we need to like organize like emergency funds for people that are have been affected by by you know like natural disasters and stuff like that um so just like you know uh keep your eyes open and, and try to be allies Yeah, I guess um, I, one piece of advice that I have or that I used to struggle with a lot was that I used to think that I wasn't doing enough. Um, I'd be in like doing a million different things all at once in as many organizations as I possibly could be in and I still never thought I was doing enough. Um, but understanding that existing is enough and that every two seconds we don't have to be doing something because we don't have the ability to change the world by ourselves. And so like just taking a step back for yourself um, because like you don't have to be co-founding a million organizations and going to X amount of rallies or protests or meetings to be doing enough. Um, and I think that educating yourself is honestly one of the best tools of resistance um, and making sure to constantly educate yourself and your community, I think um, is the best thing that you can do, especially um, in a pandemic. Thank you all for those brilliant answers. Um, we only have a little bit of time left, so I'm gonna jump to some questions. We have some really, really good questions in the chat, actually. Um, so maybe we'll limit these to two people responding um, so that we can get through as many as possible. 
But I think the first question is actually really important since a lot of you talked about how your first introduction to climate activism came in schools. So what advice would you give for talking to younger kids about climate change without absolutely terrifying them? Because as Hannah mentioned, climate anxiety is real. So what would be your tips to have education that's more focused on inspiration for action rather than fear and hopelessness? Um, I think when like you talk about it, um, cause if like you talk about the environment, it can be kind of scary. Cause I've talked to, um, youth about like the climate and you don't want to go in there and be like, oh, like, um, we have like this amount of time or else like the planet's going to end. Like, cause that's terrifying. Like, but, um, there's like different ways that like you can talk about ways that you can help because, um, I know that people have talked about the climate, but it's like, um, our planet is being destroyed right now, but you don't give ways like how can I help and how can I get involved? So you can like talk about how, um, like what's happening with the climate right now and how it's really important for youth to speak up about it because youth, um, I feel like they just need to be empowered and they just need like that little push to um, wanna speak about it because youth voices are really needed and um, they're really powerful. So just empowering youth and telling them like not only what's happening to the planet, but how you can get out there and what are like the different movements that you can join and how you can help because it's one thing just to say like of what's happening to our climate, but if we don't know how to help then um, um, we won't know, really know what to do. So we'll just feel like this is like all that we have, but um, just like talking about like the climate and then giving ways that youth can help. Um, I see the climate a lot as like a very people thing. Um, I see it as like how I interact with my neighbor, how my community um, heals. And so my little sister, she's like nine years younger than me. She's eight years old. I used to take her to uh, climate strikes with me. Um, and she'd come with me to the events and I'd explain it to her what was going on, why we were doing what we were doing. But the way that I would explain it is in a very people centered way. Like we won't have enough water or let, or um, my family's from Somalia and Somalia has floods all the time. Um, and so I guess like explaining to her like, oh, like this certain thing is happening in like our home country and this is how people are helping. Um, I, I don't know, like a problem solution thing really works. Um, but also I like to try to expose kids to as much um, as possible, just in a very um, helpful way, like talking about how people are actually doing things to help decrease X issue, um, just so they don't feel very helpless. I think maybe as a final question, because this is kind of an open-ended one, um, but thinking about all the things that we've talked about and how this is really about you know, young people being the next generation, young people being the people who are going to make change. And even thinking about diversity and inclusion specifically that we've talked about already, what are you most hopeful about right now for the future? I can go. Um, I'm most hopeful about um, seeing how many youth are starting to talk about this because like I said, youth voices are really needed. And um, when I first became activist, I didn't really know how powerful youth voices could be, but people are like, if she can do this, then I can do it also. So being a youth that really can empower others to want to make a difference and want to make a change. Um, but I'm really um, empowered to see how the future will be, seeing how youth are starting to become the leaders of the world. Yeah, just to add on to that, I think I'm super hopeful seeing how young people are feeling empowered enough to take up all these spaces um, and use their talents to their advantage. So for people that care about these issues, but you know, cannot be you know, on a panel or talk in front of people, they can utilize their other talents like film um, or communication. They can write letters and reach out to representatives, seeing how creative our generation can be in tackling these issues um, from all different sides of this issue, from every aspect, I think is super inspiring, but also really hopeful that you know, as a generation, we will be able to have such a lasting impact and also be able to reach out to these people in positions of power and show them that, you know, this is for our future. Yeah, I, I agree. I think like there's been a lot of awakening and a lot of people coming together and kind of finding this common goal. Um, you know, like just us here sitting, I've never met you guys, but we're talking about this, like we're making these connections. 
Um, we're fighting all these issues from different parts of the world in different areas maybe. Um, but like we're actually like coming together and, and really pushing for change. Um, I think it's, it's something that is, you know, it's gonna be quite historic in a few years. So um, yeah, just like seeing the uprise Yeah, I don't know. I have really nothing to add because I do think that seeing the amount of young people um, coming out and talking about um, not just the environment, but like the connection between the environment and other issues um, really brings, I guess, I just, it just makes me really hopeful. Um, also, I think that people are making those connections, like how um, clean water like impacts everybody and talking about things like environmental racism um, and how like Black Lives Matter like is intertwined with the environment or healthcare um, and things like ableism. And so honestly, I'm just really hopeful that we can have discussions like these and that more discussions like these are happening all across the world. Thank you all for that. And since we have two minutes left, we're not gonna be able to get to all of the questions, but I would love just for the people who are tuning in right now to be able to contact you guys, keep up with your work. So. If you, you want to go around quickly, say where people can find you online, if you have any upcoming projects that you're working on. I know everyone hates the like, what are you going to be doing in five years question, but just, you know, what are you, what's up next for all of you and where can people find you? I can go first. Um, uh, well, I'm, I'm finishing school like next Tuesday. Um, is like my last day of school and then I just have exams left and like I'm done with school so that's so nice um, then I'm gonna go back to my community I'm gonna um, uh, I'll probably work with children and youth for a year before I go back to university um, and yeah so that's kind of like my plan right now I, I don't really know what to do with my life <laughs> um, but yeah you can follow me on you can find me on Instagram Helena Walinga uh, right now, I'm a, I'm working on um, a GoFundMe to support Indigenous women that are facing um, violence, different types of violence, domestic violence, or even persecution. Um, so, if you want to go and support that, you so welcome to do that. Um, and we're always I'm always um, posting about like issues you can support in the Amazon, um, Indigenous people, and and yeah, like just in that spectrum. So, if you want to support, you can you can check us out there. And thank you for doing this. This was really amazing. And to, um, to like share the space with all, all of you guys, you're amazing. Um, right now I've been working on Youth Climate Save and um, that's been like my main focus right now, um, just like starting up chapters for it. Um, and we talk about how animal agriculture is harming the planet. Um, and if you wanna join Youth Climate Save, the Instagram is at Youth Climate Save. And then my Instagram is at Genesis Butler with the underscore at the end. Yeah, you can find me at Hannah for Change um, on Instagram and really all social media platforms, um, it's Hannah with the number four change. Um, but for my personal life, um, I'm hoping to graduate high school soon, I'm hopefully going into college. So if you'd like to put a good word in for me at Columbia, that would be very much appreciated. <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, I want to um, definitely continue the work that I do. A lot of my work is policy related. So um, a lot of upcoming legislation is coming out in the next few weeks and months that um, I'll definitely have more information on, so definitely look out for that um, on how you guys can help support that. But right now they're kind of under wraps, so I can't talk a whole lot about that, but definitely stay tuned for the next few weeks and months uh, because we'll definitely need the support from everybody. Um, I'm also trying to graduate high school this year. I also applied to Columbia, that's so funny. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know, really just focusing on getting into college, you know, graduating high school. And I've just been doing local work here, really. Obviously, I don't know, you all probably heard about Minneapolis in the news. So I've been trying to do as much mutual aid here as I can. Um, and it's just at Isra Hersey on all platforms. 
All right. Well, thank you to the four of you for tuning in today. I don't know how much power I hold with um, Columbia, but I will try to put in as good of a word as I can. Um, but yes, this was such a pleasure. Thank you all again for the amazing work that you do. Keep it up. Also, make sure you take care of yourselves because I know this work is not always easy. Um, but yes, also thank you to everyone who tuned in to this event. This is the second event of Columbia Climate Conversations. Um, so yes, we're really, really grateful that you all tuned in. Again, thank you to the panelists, to Ben and Kehlani for helping to organize and for Phoebe for being so amazing with helping us with the tech with this event. But yes, that's everything. So thank you all for tuning in. Okay, bye. <laughs>